into it. This is where most companies say that it, it gets it gets really expensive. It's in that middle mile where they control from the telephone exchange down to the community box. You know the community boxes, those green things, usually painted, look like flowers uh, in most neighborhoods. They serve about, let's say, from 100 to 1,000 homes. And they're usually about maybe a quarter to half a mile from your home. Now, um, today, you start off with copper in your home. Okay, let's say my home. You start off with copper in my home, and it goes to out to the, to the telephone pole. Again, it, it's copper. When it gets here, it may well be fiber. They aren't advertising, but they gradually are not putting, they're not putting any copper in. So anytime there's a backhoe incident, they have to repair something, they have to extend something, it's coming in as fiber. So all this is fiber, it's fiber up to there, that's fiber. So most of the province is kind of fiber, but you're not seeing any benefit because it's this last quarter mile. From here to here is spoken of as the last mile, but it's usually about a dozen miles. These telephone exchanges um, usually serve about, say, uh, 25,000 to a quarter million people, depending on you know, how urbanized areas. Those are the central office telephone exchange. Here in Halifax, you know the one on North Street. It's a large building um, filled with, uh, looks like uh, um, mattress frames, and it's where the real heavy money, in a sense, is. Um, what we're interested in, in is, is this little bit here, from the community box to a person's home. If this could be fibered, we would have fiber to the home. We'd have the high speeds. It would still stay copper in our own homes. Copper wire is cheap. It's very flexible. You can throw it around. It. You wouldn't want to try that with, with fiber, you know, with, with the, for, for the same grade. Um, so the problem is really, from our point of view, it's right here. From the point of view of providers, it, the dominance is in that middle mile around those telephone exchanges. Those buildings filled with very expensive routers, because um, that's what the telephone business is really about. And, and internet's no different, or cable. It's you know it's it's at the point where you split all the signals and set it off at the right time, is where the high tech end of, of the uh, of the business is. Now, the, it's nothing new. We had hundreds and hundreds of last mile phone companies in, in Nova Scotia up until the 60s and 70s. Now this is a relatively big one, I think it has about 16 names on it. I found some with six. And they literally ran a mile. They measured it, 1.1 mile. So they had six customers, 1.1 mile. They existed forever. Uh, they still do in Ontario. And then they would connect up to this thing. That fairly large build, building, and usually in most small towns, uh, there was a brick building, and if you wandered inside, you'd see walls and walls of this that made clicky clacking noises. And that was where that was where the telephone company really had the monopoly. You, the, it was relatively easy to run that that mile of pole because you're all volunteering, you're all neighbors, you had to work together, no fuss, no muss. When you get to this end, it's really expensive and relatively complicated. And so this is this is where when we complain about high prices, we're talking about it. It's at, the, it's at that particular middle mile that causes us problems. We can handle the other stuff. This is the, the green box. It's unpainted, but usually it's painted. What we're talking about, a community box. That's not its technical name, but um, in there may be a variety of company services. Not chip, could be power, could be could be all cable, telephone, um, or you could have a couple of cluster boxes around there. Um, but from there to your homes is well within a volunteer group or a small community uh, uh, handling it. If if we had small municipalities, you could see the town of Berwick perhaps running it a bit further back to a central office and running as they do in Ontario. They may have 15,000 customers. But in HRM, it's difficult to see HRM suddenly getting in and competing with the line. So we're probably talking about uh, us running it from here to your homes and a couple hundred homes as a volunteer effort. Now, when it gets to your home, it has to, there's another box stuck on the outside of your house because um, one of the things with, that uh, uh, Andrew was mentioning about optical uh, systems is they're fairly high-ended but they're at the beginning when you put it all in it's cheaper later. That's sort of true, but these can be upgraded because you're, you're taking your electronic signals running over copper and you're turning them into pulses of light. You're sending them through a cable and at the other end you're then taking that and translating it back. If the, Once the cable's in place, you, you almost never have to take it up unless you bust it. 
that these can be upgraded. So you can, it's relatively cheap to take that box off and put a much more expensive box at either end as technology improves. So one, the fixed cost of putting in the cable, of optical fiber cable, once it's in there, it doesn't really have to be upgraded every 10 years. If they, if they threaten you with, you know, you can't be so obsolete. Because it can, they can make quite a few changes at the box end. And you can see that's much easier to work than imagining going from place to place and trying to put in a new fiber. Now, here's what it looks like. If you've ever seen a picture of an undersea cable, <coughs> you'll find some similarity. But bear in mind, these are not a, this is not an inch across. This is smaller than a human hair. But an undersea cable, a lot of the expenses, all these layers upon layers upon layers of various stuff, <laughs> trying to keep out uh, water, trying to keep out electrical effects, and so on. We have somewhat the same situation with fiber. That stuff remains, the cladding cost remains the same whether there's just one little fiber in there or there's a thousand. Now, when you come to lay it, uh, you pay a, a fair price for the, for the cable, but your biggest price is actually getting permissions as you're running it along. It, you're actually spending most of your money going to meetings. And so in countries where their minds are focused on getting fiber to the homes, everything is Charlie Hustle. Everything works quickly. Here in Nova Scotia, it's like, I'll get back to you, maybe a week Sunday. And you know, you're, so what do you do? You're paying a well-paid man like Terry to go from meeting to meeting as everyone sort of struggles to agree to put the stuff up. So it's more expensive even the backhoe and the backhoe guy if you need backhoes in, like in, in, in downtown Halifax. So what the people do, and these, these fiber networks are often, as Terry mentioned, independent of the telephone company and the cable company. They're not a common carrier. They, they connect maybe a bunch of businesses or a bunch of, of universities. They will put in far more fiber than they need inside there. Um, and so at least 99% is, is unlit, unused. Because not only do you have a lot of these unlit, but any one of these you can use more expensive amplifiers at either end and up the speed of the amount of, quad, of information you're putting into each of those with a bit more money. So again, without having to dig up the thing, you can sort of quadruple or more or more and more the amount of information just coming from the fiber. Then if you really get frisky, you just turn on more lights. You light up more fiber. So they've got a lot, a lot of capacity unused. And of course, their bean counters would like them to recover some of that cost, which is why when we go visiting them and asking them, can we tap into your system, they're going to say yes while the telephone company says, you know, take, a, take a hike. So we've been in business for 15 years. In, in, the, in our, our role, we see is getting communities connected to the net. And so we're now talking about this greater Spryfield area. Now, the cost of putting fiber to the home varies. It's actually more expensive downtown Japan because you'll hear all the telephone companies and the cable companies saying the reason why Japan has got so much of this in is because they're so compact. That isn't necessarily so. You could probably say that the most reasonable way to get it in is putting it from telephone pole to telephone pole, utility pole, because there's far fewer permissions, there's a lot less digging, and so on. Um, the cost of, of running the cable, the cost of buying the cable is a lot less than sometimes doing all that digging and not cutting things open. So don't buy into, don't, you know, don't buy into that big lot. Spryfield is actually well located to, to, to have uh, fiber pot to the home running off the poles. Now, when we get to an area like Sambro, there might be a different solution. Oh, sorry, I forgot about this slide. Okay, this, since 1911, this is Scriber owned rural phone system. It's a small village somewhere up in Huron County. I couldn't even, I've never heard of it. I'm folks are from Ontario. I had to go to a map, it's that small. But they, I came across them because I was looking for a company that actually in Canada has actually provided fiber to the home. And there aren't many, there's just a couple. God damn it, isn't this one of them? This is a tiny farm based, they own it. And they've done fiber. And all the big boys haven't been able to do it. They're out in rural Ontario, in the backwoods, sort of uh, cottage country. They're owned by themselves. They have bought fiber to each and every home. So don't say it can't be done. Because if, if anyone's rolling a ball up here,